I have seen Moxie show up more recently in the tender moments, in empathizing with each other, is in sitting with one another in grief and in pain, sitting in the questions and instead of arguing them, just being okay with not knowing. You know, it's it's a gentleness and that takes more work for me. It takes more work for me to experience Moxie at that level. You're listening to God Hears Her, a podcast for women where we explore the stunning truth that God hears you, he sees you, and he loves you because you are his. Find out how these realities free you today on God Hears Her. Welcome to God Hears Her. I'm Elisa Morgan. And I'm Erin Atkins. Today, we are so excited to talk with one of the hosts of Unshakable Moxie, a film series by Our Daily Bread Ministries. Mariah Smallbone is a woman of many talents. She's a singer and a songwriter, an actress, and now a docuseries host. We can't wait for you to get to know her and how her understanding of Moxie changed while Unshakable Moxie was still in the filming stage. Let's start this God Hears Her conversation by asking Mariah, who were you as a little girl? When I think about a memory from my childhood with my mom, I think about just how gracious she was with my sister and I. Mm. I have an older sister, and her and I are both very similar. We're we're both creative. We're both competitive. We're both athletes, performers, but also kind of introverted, but also kind of extroverted. Like we're just this really weird dichotomy. Mm. I think it takes a very gracious woman to manage Mm. and to raise Mm. women like that. (laughs) (laughs) So my, my mom was always really, really kind with us. We didn't have a lot of money. My dad was a public defender mm. that worked in the LA court system. And so my mom would make a, instead of buying clothes, she would make us a lot of a lot of clothes. And so she Aww. she made us these like matching red checkered dresses and we had a birthday party at a park by our house. So you said your dad worked for the LA court system. Mm-hmm. So you grew up in Los Angeles? Yeah, so just outside of LA, there's like a suburb called Chino. Okay. For those who live in the LA area, Chino is the place that you go if you want to see like a hardcore like metal show or if you want to join a bike gang <laughs> or there's some pretty big churches there with like cool youth group, some cool dance factories, and a prison and a dairy. That's a lot. Everything you need. (laughs) (laughs) One stop. It's a unique place. The longer I've lived in Nashville, the more I have come to really, really Mm. appreciate where I grew up and how I grew up. Mm -hmm. You know, to grow up in such a diverse place, to grow up in a culture where I was exposed to so many different religions and people groups and political values. And maybe that's part of why I feel like I'm a walking contradiction with so many different opposing sides, because I grew up very comfortable Mm -hmm. with that. I grew up in a place where you date people that are, you know, very different from you or your neighbors with people who are completely different religions, religions that would almost seemingly oppose each other. And yet you're hanging out at parties and having each other over for dinner. So I like that about where I grew up. It sounds very eclectic is one of the words that's coming to mind and therefore very textured. And Mm -hmm. honestly, very much eventually the way the body of Christ was intended to be in terms of everyone and everything belongs, you know. How did you find God? Or how did God find you? You could turn it around the other way too, in such a a diverse, wonderful kind of melting pot of life. I was one of those kids that my parents didn't force me to go to church. Like I I desperately wanted Mm -hmm. to be there. And I think, you know, from a very like practical level, it was a place where I could 
feel affirmed in some of the decisions I wanted to make in order to feel safe. Mm -hmm. A lot of my friends, a lot of family, a lot of people that I grew up with had teen pregnancies and had sex before they wanted to. And I think when you grow up in a very like heightened, sexualized culture, you do certain things to try to either go with the flow or go against the flow. And yeah. for me, being able to have a stamp of approval, if you will, for being different mm. was helpful. Mm. You know, I, I, I had a lot of those social moments where I liked a guy or, you know, really hoped that he would like me, but he didn't love mm. that I was so like, don't touch me, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And, you know, it's unfortunate because I think that intimacy is a beautiful thing and flirting is beautiful and kissing mm -hmm. is beautiful and all of those things that, that you get to do when you're dating and you're forming different relationships and learning more about yourself and your own sensuality and the sensuality of those around you. But I just was not in a safe enough environment to explore mm. or experiment in that way. Yeah, It just would have gone too far too fast. So it was important for me, I think, to have that permission, if you will, mm. to do it differently. I think you spend so much of your life like trying to prevent that and being afraid of that yeah, because it's happening all around you and mm. you're seeing all of the stresses that come along with that and girlfriends and, you know, friends who were that I was on basketball team with or cheered mm. with and they have to drop out of school and it's like the stress that comes along with that. And so, yeah, I think having those very strict boundaries was helpful for me to stay focused on school, mm. to stay focused on sports and achievement and to help me get past like maybe a bit of the rejection and the heartbreak of like, if I'm not willing to offer that, I'm not going to be sought after by a bunch of guys. Mm. And that's if that's not the only reason I was also and still am 5'10 and like awkward and not necessarily, you know, hottie on a stick all the time so <laughs> it, but now I look back at that and I go it's funny how you have to do the work to let go mm -hmm. of something that held you in such safekeeping then That's and so now good. it mm -hmm. doesn't serve me in fact it, it would be harmful for me to behave in the super safe culture that I live yeah. in now, I think uh, the county I live in is like in the like top 100 safest counties in, in the country. <laughs> and to be so like off putting and defensive and scared and, you know, that that wouldn't even be healthy in my marriage. Mm -hmm. So it's just interesting that there are things that serve you as mm -hmm. as a kid and then or even teenager and then maybe don't don't serve you as well as an adult. I love the very personal reflective thread of this conversation, Mariah, and thank you for inviting us in. But what I'm hearing is, and I want to kind of normalize this for everybody who's listening, I think what you're expressing is a profound, necessary leaving of what incubated, of what was vital and important, mm -hmm. womb-like, if you will, mm -hmm. to allow you to, to grow and form and develop. When we don't have that safety infrastructure, we're going to create our own because it's either have it or create it or die. You know, it's one mm -hmm. of those. So you had it, you created it. But as we get older, there's great wisdom in what you're expressing. Some of the richness that, that you have expressed there. I think our spiritual journeys often surprise us mm -hmm. when they aren't linear or they aren't um, formulaic fitting into mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. or that denomination yeah i appreciate that and i I'll, I'll ask you a question i think that this question should be asked more and i think that it should be asked more amongst women and i think there should be a level of pride in discussing it but in spanish if i were to ask you this question it's cuantos años tienes and that is not how old are you? It's how many years do you have? That's so good. Mm -hmm. And when you say, you know, I am, you know, 31, for example, yo tengo 31 años. So I have 31 years. And mm -hmm. I think that frames it differently. I, I think that. there's a 
acceptance and like pride that comes with that. So I want to ask you that because I have a follow-up question to that. But ¿cuántos años tienes, Elisa? Yo tengo 68 años. 68 sí. años. Yeah, sí. that's so cool. Okay, someone's going to kill me for my pronunciations there, but <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It. I think it's really special <laughs> to hear you, Elisa, with the 68 years that you have, that you've earned, that you own, mm. to speak to that particular concept of building a container and then either Mm. throwing the container away or finding what you put in it because listening to you share that metaphor that perspective I think it helps Mm. I think it helps people to to go it's okay it's Mm. okay for me to process it's okay for me to as my friend recently told me because I was telling her I was like well, I have this bucket of like work and then I have this bucket of my life and then I have this bucket of like, you know, beliefs. And, and she's like, Mariah, there are, and she's a bit older than me. She's like, there are no buckets. Kick <laughs> the buckets, Mariah. <laughs> so it's nice when people who have more years, you know, yeah. encourage you to do so. Thank you for that, What did you, you do that, with Elisa. that? What did you, did you kick the buckets? What did you do? I want to know. Oh, I sure <laughs> did. In fact, I text her two emojis, like a boot and a bucket. And oh, it was oh, like, cute. It's, it's done. We don't look at life through buckets anymore. Were you looking at your life through, life through buckets within like career, family, relationship were you kind Mm. of compartmentalizing them kind of thing Mm. yeah I'm a real compartmentalizer and it's I'm an artist I'm a producer Mm. I'm an actress and so as a creative Mm. I think there comes with that the stereotype of like manic and chaotic and like I mean I use white boards and dream boards (laughs) and like at my house is like every wall is white and there's nothing on the surfaces people are like do you live here I'm like I swear I do (laughs) So I naturally, I'm an organizer, I am a processor, and I really do like to see life Mm -hmm. in buckets. And sometimes that is helpful, you know, particularly when managing emotions or, you know, Mm -hmm. trying to practice good leadership with my employees like that. That's important to be able to compartmentalize at times. Uh But when it comes to dreaming, Uh when it comes to vision casting, when it comes to making like big decisions about the next few years of your life or marriage, you know, children, what any of that stuff. It's like, I need to do a better job Mm -hmm. of trusting the spirit and going, maybe on paper, this doesn't all make sense. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like yesterday, I watched a video. My sister got a ton of VHS tapes that were at my grandparents' house uh, converted (laughs) into digital. So she's been texting us a bunch of video clips and there was some footage of my parents' wedding. And I know they've said this story a thousand times. There's something about seeing it. Mm. They got married in a courthouse on their lunch break. (laughs) And then they had their ceremony at a Black Angus afterwards (laughs) uh, with a bunch of friends and coworkers and family afterwards. So it's like they didn't have a lot of the things that I have now, which affords me the opportunity to make very calculated decisions. Mm -hmm. But for them, they didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. And my mom, she sat down with my dad, who is probably more like me and likes to make lists. And he created Mm -hmm. a pro and con list Mm -hmm. of why it's a good idea for us to get married, why it's not (laughs) a good idea for us to marry get married there and that list of knots was Mm -hmm. very very long (laughs) a lot of i mean they had no money they had nowhere to live they she's living in a trailer she's like it's like what are they gonna do and my mom sat there and turned every single thing on the not list into a positive Mm. and she kind of kicked the buckets Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. I'm trying to do that more I really am (laughs) you know I think it's fascinating I mean I'm listening to your words and I'm hearing again this is this kind of echo of this theme Mm -hmm. Um, you know you've been a part of our daily bread's unshakable moxie Mm -hmm. series and it's so interesting to me that the Lord has braided your life into this project in a season when you yourself are experiencing a different level of moxie, you know, that's bubbled up from your own growth and formation 
but it's you know another metaphor you're like crashing through the seed and some new life is blooming in you that's more organic and free how have you defined moxie maybe before you started working mm-hmm. on this topic and, and then how did it shape your understanding of god's work of moxie in you even as you participated gosh like even from episode one to today moxie means something different we filmed the first episode at my birthday party last year, which was a very crucial turning point for me on so many levels. Mm-hmm. It was my entering into the decade I had always dreamed of being in. And it was also a celebration of my grandmother's life who had just received word that she had gone into remission for breast cancer so it was so celebratory it was so beautiful we made it really an ode to her and her culture and where Mm -hmm. she came from she immigrated from mexico and so we brought a mariachi band we had a taco truck my friends and i did a traditional folklorico dance which folklorico for those who don't know is like picture the word folklore Mm -hmm. and it's a traditional Mexican dance in different regions of Mexico, you know, they have different style skirts, different dance moves. But yeah, I got all my girlfriends who are like Filipino, Caucasian, uh, Puerto Rican, <laughs> black. Like I had like so many, like not a single Mexican friend that are like so generously, like, yes, we will do this dance. I love and we that. and we did a whole choreographed <laughs> so number and it was so sweet because the Unshakable Moxie crew got to capture it and they were here and we made salsa with my grandmother and we talked about Moxie. We talked about the beginning mm-hmm. of the journey of like, what does this mean? And what are we trying to understand? And what are we trying to mm-hmm. learn? And what kind of questions are we going to be asking? And what do we think Moxie means now? And I mm-hmm. think then I very much saw Moxie as a strength that is maybe more aggressive, more assertive, more Mm. willing to sit in the conflict, comfortable with disagreement. I love questioning things. Like maybe it's just being the daughter of a lawyer. Like I I love to not just think about what I believe and fight for that, but to completely throw off everything I believe and then jump into Mm. someone else's belief system and then argue that side and understand that side and to do it Mm. with my whole heart, not just Mm -hmm. by obligation and I think that's certainly an element of what moxie can be Mm. but in the last year be it in conversations with the women that we interviewed or conversations with my own friends my own Witten and when I reference Witten this is a um a throwback to the early formation of England and and the kings of the time would select different people in their community and kind of put together like a, a room or a round table of thought leaders and people who disagreed on different things and came from different parts of the region in order to make decisions. And so I have that in my life. I, I've put together my own witten of women that I call on and they come from all different backgrounds and beliefs and workspaces so and the word witten is like a group like of advisors, w-i-t-a-n kind of. yes yeah the king's I witten love, <laughs> love it so love it. be it in okay. communicating with them or my own mm. family you know my sister my mom i think where i have seen moxie show up mm-hmm. more recently is in the tender moments is Mm -hmm. in empathizing with each other, is in sitting with one another in grief and in pain, sitting in the questions and instead of arguing them, just being okay with not knowing. You know, it's it's a gentleness. And that takes more work for me. It takes more work for me to experience moxie at that level because naturally – Maybe it's my super high testosterone levels. I don't know. I'm just like a lot. <laughs> I'm very, I can be very combative. And so it, it, yeah, it takes, it takes work to sit in the more graceful, kind, gentle aspects of what moxie can look like. But I think it's in that 
perceived weakness that there's actually the deepest strength. I love that you said that, Mariah. When we hear the word moxie and we think resiliency and we think grit and we think, you know, a tenaciousness, Mm -hmm. the natural tendency is to visualize like a toughness. You're bold, you're brave, you're, uh, you know, and the truth is there's so much, it's hard to fight for tenderness, but it's so worth it Mm -hmm. when you do. It's harder. I think for me, I completely resonate with that Mm. because I do have a lot of opinions, but I have a lot more questions and I've gone through some things that have, you know, I've had to pray that God would keep my heart soft so that it wouldn't be hardened from the pain and the hurt and just the depravity of life that we witness on a day, day in and day out basis. And so I just love that you said what you have witnessed within Moxie, within your friend group, and then within, or your Witten, and what you've witnessed with Unshakable Moxie, this docuseries that's coming out. I love that you said there's a tenderness, there's a softness. I think a woman that's listening right now can really take a deep breath to go, okay, so softness and tenderness is not weakness. I think we can mistake that easily, don't you think? Yeah, and I, rightfully so. Like, it's understandable, particularly we're living in a patriarchal society. And when that's the case, it's the character traits of our brothers that are put on display as if you want to get this result, you have to do it this way. And I'm not one to like take it scriptural, (laughs) but if we're made in God's image, why would my brother be any closer of a reflection of who God is than I am? And Mm -hmm. why would my dad be any more of a reflection than who God is than my mother is? I think that you see in scripture, you know, all of these beautiful maternal aspects of who God is. Yes, the warrior. Yes, the protector. Yes, the Ezra Konegdo, the shield, you know, the strength, all of that is is made up in in the protective nature of of a woman, but also the hen analogy, you know, the mm-hmm. the mother hen hiding under the shadow of of his wings, you know, all of these beautiful metaphors and poetry about the maternal aspects of who God is. It is difficult, I will say, to Mm. reconcile that, although it might be true in a culture and in a time where the people who are the gatekeepers, the CEOs, leaders of our free market are primarily Mm. men. And so for those listening who might be entrepreneurs, who might be, you know, climbing a corporate ladder, what do you do with that? How do you look at your progress so far and go, I've gotten to where I am because I have been tough. I have been aggressive. I have been competitive. Am I supposed to throw all of that out and just be this like Mm -hmm. meek and mild person? I don't think so. I don't think that it's wrong or bad to to be any of those Mm -hmm. things. I do think that there is value in what we're talking about, in in tenderness. There is value in slowing down. There is value in silence. And I think both men and women in our history have led with those characteristics. Speak softly, carry a big stick. Like there are ways to, to show strength and moxie in a kind and loving way. You know, look at how a mother speaks to her child. Sometimes my sister-in-law will look at her son and like with a loving tone, correct him. And I feel Mm. like I want to fall on the floor into a million pieces because I'm so terrified. (laughs) Like you see, like (laughs) speak with such authority and such love at the same time. Whereas when someone's like yelling at me, I'm like, I want to yell back, you know? So so I think there's a lot of value in seeing the range of character traits that I think maybe are more innate to women and more innate to men. But when you see the balance of men going, I'm leaning into this softness or women going, I'm leaning into my competitive nature. Like it's all about integration. It's about that balance. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I just happen to be really hard on one side and I need to, you know, try to take steps towards (laughs) the middle. (laughs) 
I'm so interested to see how Mariah grapples with these realizations during the Unshakable Moxie episodes. You know, her understanding of Moxie and herself has been morphed and changed in some really beautiful ways. Yes. Well, before we go, be sure to check out our website to find a link for the Moxie website. This series comes out soon. So be sure to save the link to watch the whole series. You can find that and more at GodHearsHer.org. That's GodHearsHer.org. Thanks for joining us. And don't forget, God hears you. He sees you. And He loves you because you are His. Today's episode was engineered by Ann Stevens and produced by Jade Gussman and Mary Jo Clark. We also want to thank Melissa and Luann for all their help and support. Thanks, everyone. God Hears Her is a production of Our Daily Bread Ministries.